Hey, it's your host, Brittany, and welcome to the Mom Sweat Sanity Podcast, where we talk all things life, health, fitness, kids, relationships, you name it, nothing is off the table. A little bit of just me and a whole lot of knowledgeable guests. So throw on your Lulus to run or to mom, grab yourself a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, and join us as we unpack life's pressing topics and learn a little bit more of the who, what, whys of it all. Or at the very least, get real, share some wisdom, and grab practical tips to help in our daily lives. Hey everyone, thanks so much for tuning in today. Today I got to sit and chat with Dr. Stacy Sims. Dr. Stacy Sims is an applied researcher, innovator, and entrepreneur in human performance, specifically in the sex differences of training, nutrition, and environmental conditions. She has a wealth of information in Women Are Not Small Men, and if you don't know what that means, you must read her book, Roar, and sign up for a course or look for all of her information with regards to why women are not small men, how we should be training for our body, fueling our body, and taking care of the female physiology as we, again, are not small men. So dive into today's conversation. It was a great one. Why don't we just dive right in? And if you can maybe give us a little background on yourself and how you began down this path of female research and women are not small men. Oh, gosh. I feel like I'm on the spot. No, I <laughs> got your questions earlier. So I am a female athlete performance physiologist, got my chops in nutrition science and exercise physiology. And when I was an undergrad as an athlete and, and student started asking questions, especially in the ex-phys labs about, you know, where the data on women, how does this apply and didn't get the right answers. So that kind of was like, always the questioner and always asking why. And that kind of pushed through to the academic career, like wanting to know the answers of why women weren't really responding as well as the men, especially on the crew team. And then as I went through my high-end professional cycling career and that kind of stuff, really trying to understand why things weren't quite going the way they said they should be. So having the availability to ask questions and then get in the lab to answer the questions. And the more you dig in, the more you realize that all the protocols, the methodologies, the guidelines is all based on male data. And I think about all the female athlete performance potential that's just left on the table because we've been training, we being told what to do based on male data. And we're inherently not men. From birth, we're different, right? So yeah, that's been the whole push of we need to relook at this and really start accepting that not only do we have the individualized and what they're calling precision training, but it's really looking and digging into how can we appropriately train our women to get the most of them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And is that then the background of all of that, where the inspiration for your book Roar came from to put it all kind of into paper for like-minded, like myself, individuals to really understand more of our female physiology? That was actually the brainchild of my co-author, Celine Yeager, because we had worked together because she's a journalist and she contacted me to do different pieces with her. And it was, I think, right around the time that we launched Osmo, the sport drink company. And I had her come out to trial the women's specific line and showing her all these things that we can do to biohack and hydration. And then a few months later, she emailed me. She's like, we need to put this all in a book. And I pitched it to Rodell and they're really excited about it. And I was like, okay, I've never written a book before, but let's see how that goes. Yeah. And so they loved it. We got it published and yeah, and then it's just gone off. It's great. I loved that book. It was so eye-opening, but also really you were able to dispel so many myths and really hit on why I felt certain ways through my cycle and why, you know, I could lift heavy one day and that, but not run the same pace that I would usually love to. So being able to really understand that the psychology was able to really turn in the brain. So yeah, yeah. it allows a lot of women who are like, And I put myself in this category before I really started putting everything together, where it's that self-doubt. Why am I not performing how I should be? Did I not recover well? Did I not sleep well? Did I not eat well? Am I not fit enough? What's going on? And then when you start tracking, it's your cycle and understanding how your cycle can affect everything. Then you go, oh, okay, well, every month I feel this way on this particular day. So it's not my fitness. It's not the way I recovered. It's the fact that 
I should be listening more to how my body's responding and save the hard stuff for the days that I can push. Mm -hmm. And I found, I'm not sure, I would imagine like so many women, many end up finding themselves in that low energy state because they have just pushed themselves through for so long. And I definitely experienced burnout and the adrenal dysfunction and all of that. Mm -hmm. Wish Mm -hmm. I had read this book way sooner. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, we've done some research looking at over 50% of recreational female athletes are in this low energy state and pushed from diet trends and the 1980s idea of calories in calories out. And if I eat less and I burn more than lose weight, we know that's not true. So if you women get into the cycle and then they just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and they burn out and they don't get the results they want. And it's just, yeah, it's one of the ongoing frustrations across all levels of of people who exercise from getting into it to the elite athlete. Yeah. It's like a hamster wheel. You just keep trying to do the same thing. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) It's amazing to me still though, that like with this knowledge that is so new and it shouldn't be so new, but with right. the female physiology that it is still so amiss in our healthcare standards, especially I'm from Canada. If we want anything in terms of this type of guidance, we have to see a functional doctor or a naturopath. It mm-hmm. is not even in the depth of the GP's practice to go down this direction. Right. And I think that's a lot of it across the board. A lot of times if a woman presents like menstrual cycle dysfunction or dead and fatigue, the GP will look for iron or put them on an oral contraceptive pill, but they don't actually dig in and say, okay, what's going on here? Mm. And part of it also is the education system where they aren't taught a lot of it. And then a lot of it, again, is the marginalization of women and the generalization of data for men. And I always say, you know, if the menstrual cycle was a male problem, there would be an optimal education solution around it. It wouldn't be put someone on the pill or, you know, oh, well, you want to manipulate this because it's a bad thing to have. All the things that we say and think across our lives about how if I lose my period, then I must be fit enough or I don't care. It doesn't really bring me anything or it's a nuisance. All these negative thought processes. If it was a male issue, then I don't think it would be the same. It would be something to be embraced. So it's still trying to get people to switch it from that lens into this is an empowerment. These are good things to have. Absolutely. And is that where your term coined the women are not small men came from? No, that came from giving sex difference lectures when I was at Stanford. And I'd always give a lecture primarily after lunch when everyone was tired. And it was a way to wake a lot of the undergrads up where you go, okay, now this is about the reason women are not small men. And people are like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. And then it kind of stuck with people and we ran with it. So, yeah. Well, it is a great catchphrase, but you know, it's a hundred percent true. So (laughs) it is. Yeah. I'll have to listen into that a lot more. That's for sure. And then you have another famous phrase, lift heavy shit. Yes. So <laughs> can we dive into that? <laughs> yeah, that came about when I was putting together a keynote for the Training Peaks Endurance Summit. And everyone talks about long, slow distance, LSD. And for menopausal women, it doesn't work. And when you're perimenopause, it doesn't work. So really trying to get people out of the mindset of long, slow distance, and they need to lift heavy and go and that top end high intensity stuff. So it's like, instead of LSD, we're LHS, that's lift heavy shit, trying to get those acronyms. And then I was like, wait, no, I love it. Everyone should lift heavy shit. So my husband's always like, no, it's lift heavy stuff. You have to be PC. I'm like, no, lift heavy shit. <laughs> it's again, it's very catchy. And I th- I agree. I think everyone should. And I have myself just really started to hone into the strength and as a female, see the difference in that so quickly when you actually focus on that and feel so much stronger in so many ways. So yeah, the heavy shit it is. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've dabbled in and out. I started lifting when I was in high school so many years ago with a friend whose brother was into bodybuilding. And she's like, hey, I've got to the gym. My brother, you should come too. And I was running cross country at the time. I was like, wow, this is awesome. I feel great. And then through rowing and cycling. So it's just been part of the undercurrent, everything I've done since I was, you know, before I was 20. And then when you have the upsurgence of things like CrossFit and functional training and people are lifting and it's becoming more in vogue, but people aren't doing it quite right for what they should be doing. Uh It's like, 
great. Now we can introduce another kind of tangent concept that is going to gravitate towards women to get them into the gym to do stuff that's going to benefit them, not only from a sporting perspective, but then you also have the aesthetic perspective as well as the longevity perspective across the board. So if I were to choose one thing, I'd tell people just lift heavy shit. <laughs> Climb some stairs at a fast pace and lift heavy shit. <laughs> awesome. So you offer some amazing online resources as well as courses and programs. I was fortunate enough to take one last spring and loved every minute of it. You are launching another one coming up. Which course are you launching? So we have the full Women Are Not Small Men, which is about women across the board. And then we have the menopause one that's specific for peri and postmenopause. We're starting a bunch of little mini courses to deep dive into small particular topics. And this fall, we'll do one specific on puberty and the youth athlete. So just trying to touch on all the the lifespan and then develop some coaching resources because, you know, you have to have that applied aspect is you have all this information. Well, now how do I apply it to my particular athletes for myself? So bringing it back more into the applied. So if you come, you're like, I've taken the women are not small men, but I didn't quite understand how to periodize or apply it to my athletes. And there's the coaching one. And you can do it for menopause or for the youth athletes. So yeah. That's fantastic. Busy lady. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I am a mother of two girls. I believe you're a mother of a daughter also. One little girl. Yep. One daughter. So it's not so much a, a conversation of focus, I would say, that we have in the under or this younger age bracket. So I'm really happy to hear that you're coming out with something in the fall time. But as the period begins and, you know, the time of our children development and going forward into youth and then birth control, contraceptives, things like that. I mean, where do we begin to make sure that we don't screw up, let's say, our, you know, our children's bodies and their hormones before right. they're at, at that next level of, you know, so often it was take this birth control, go to the doctor and they, you know, prescribe you something and walk out the door. But how do yeah. we, how do we navigate that? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, even in the schools, they used to talk about, you used to have health classes, but they've taken that out. So now it's becoming more of peer or coach or parent. And we need to open up those conversations and make them not taboo and mm-hmm. starting early really normalizing the idea of having a period and changes. It's hard. I mean, I look at my eight-year-old and I was like, there's no way she'd understand this stuff. But slowly introducing things like I bought tampons. And she's like, what are those, mommy? I'm like, and they're kind of like band-aids that women need every month. Well, why? And then you have to kind of explain. And she's like, "Mm, that's a bit weird. But it's just (laughs) like starting to settle a little bit of those ideas in early. Mm -hmm. Not trying to make it scary. No, not at all. And there's some good graphic novels, like cartoon type novels that are good for kids. But when we talk about it around the 13, 14 year old girls are in sport, Mm -hmm. this is where it becomes really important to have that conversation that's normalized because you have different levels of maturity, biological maturity, psychological maturity. The impetus is dropped out of sport because bodies are changing and not putting it into the too hard and ignoring basket, but really trying to talk about it in a normal sense. And yeah, we know these are happening. Your hips are widening. You feel ungangly. Your your center of gravity is different. And it's not a reason to stop what you're doing, but just understand your body's changing and we need to work with that. We need to make you strong in all levels of movement. And it empowers the teenage girl too, to be like, oh, I'm going to get strong in all of these. My performance will eventually improve. And having the conversations about the low energy availability, like working with teenage athletes to see some of their peers who developed later who are now super fast because they're thinner, right? And so they stop eating because they want to be as fast as then and explaining it's a short-term gain. Like if you're impairing things now, we don't have Olympic athletes when you're teenagers. We have Olympic athletes when we're in our 20s. Mm-hmm. So let's see, how do we get there? Like if you want that, for yourself or your parents and you decide that that's a path you want to take and really understanding the long-term and having those conversations a long way to encourage the long-term picture instead of that short-term that so many kids are in it. And I think that would help dispel some of the, you know, the body dysmorphia and whatnot that the kids really go through at such a young age these days. I know. 
I know. It's so and scary. It, it is. It is. Looking at diet culture and I mean, my kid doesn't have a phone, but wants one because her friends do and trying to police what she watches on YouTube, which is hard for her screen time. But there are some even Disney programs that still influence the way girls think. And it's like, got to really knock it down. So if I see something, I'm like, that's a really stupid show. <laughs> my daughter would be like, it's not stupid. I'm like, yes, it is. Look, they're making the girls all skinny and frilly and the men all macho. I'm like, girls should be the warriors. And so she's like, yeah, why aren't the girls the warriors with the muscles? So just mm-hmm. calling out the stereotypes when you see them. Yeah, absolutely. Making it, yeah. Not so one versus one, because that's really, as you said, women are not small men. That's not the way any of us are formed. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. So any upcoming books from you further? I mean, your course load is full. It sounds like I'm excited to take some more programs. Yeah. So our follow-up to Roar, it was supposed to come out in July, but because of COVID got pushed to December, but it's hitting in the perimenopause and menopause set. So it'll be a book for that age group. And then hopefully after that's out, they'll let us update Roar because there are a few things in there because science evolves and there's things I want to change. (laughs) Hopefully we can revamp that. But we know for sure that the second book is coming out now at the end of the year instead of the middle of the year. Awesome. That's exciting to watch out for. Yeah. So you, I know that you were on, so Osmosis at one point there and then noon you were working with their hydration and whatnot. Are you still a team with them or? Not so much. I help them with their podium series and that's their whole powder drink and in regular contact with Kevin and, and do some expert stuff with them as well. I've kind of gotten more out of the hydration realm and Mm -hmm. gotten into some other nutraceutical stuff. And my business partner, Hannah Grant, she's a professional chef that I met when we were working with some of the teams of the Tour de France. Oh, wow. So we, yeah. So we we initially launched a jet lag product, but then everyone started flying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but everyone will start flying, I'm sure, as a mass as soon as yeah. they can. <laughs> yeah. So we now have pivoted and gotten back into the hydration space. So we have low carbohydrate hydration drink, and then we have or sleep stuff that's coming out that has adaptogens and things in it to help people sleep. Oh, and wow. That's great. It's a combination of all the stuff that we've used over the years when we've had really super long days and traveling and know that it works. And there's nothing else that's taking the science and then taking the professional chef angle to make it taste good uh-huh. without artificial stuff. Yeah, so pretty excited when that's coming out because it has really good efficacy. And if there's anything people really need sleep. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I was, I guess, avid consumer of noon, but until I had listened to you and through the course, actually didn't realize how little rehydration just the tablets had in them. So I switched to the podium series for the, nice. the longer, yeah, the longer training, but same with the jet lag, <laughs> the longer training days definitely took a hit for me through COVID. <laughs> So, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, we'll have to get back to that soon. So how do you make time for yourself? Do you have some daily routines, morning moments? You're a busy lady. You have a child at home also, especially through COVID. How did you make time for yourself? I have a very supportive husband who we split the bulk of the child care, but sometimes he takes more of it. And I always get up early. I get up before everyone else. I've gotten into doing a lot of swimming because it's kind of no one's talking to you, right? There's no one talking to you when your head's in the water, which is nice. I do miss cycling and I miss running and stuff. And then I have weights in the gym and our gyms are open. So I go and it's pretty much I've gotten out of being a cyclist into being swimming and gymming. And it's very strange. (laughs) I like what you said though, about no one being able to speak to you in the water. And I did hear someone refer to swimming as the new age meditation because of that. You can get into a trance. Yeah. 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 And I think I just did my last ocean swim of the season this morning because the water temperature is just, it's 18 degrees Celsius, but the air temperature was four. So it's a bit bit chilly. chilly. (laughs) But the visibility was incredibly clear and you could see everything and it was calm and it was flat and was beautiful. I'm like, 
I wish I could be a winter swimmer, but I just can't do it. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So do you have any, are races back open where you are located? Yeah, but I'm not racing. They had Ironman New Zealand, and then there's a whole bunch of ultra runs and multi-sport stuff. So we're relatively normal. Yeah. So it's been interesting to see just the New Zealanders racing because we can't have very many, many internationals at all, unless they're already here. Okay. So it's, a, it's racing, but it's not the same level that people are used to. It's definitely, a, everyone is adapting this year. It's, it looks right. a lot different everywhere. Right. I saw a post from, I think it was Utah, where they are including face masks in the swag bag. Oh I was like, gosh. oh yeah, <laughs> that's the COVID times. Yeah, for sure. I hope that we all can look back at this and, you know, kind of laugh in a way at how crazy this time was and that we made it through. But, oh my gosh, I know. living through this time is something else. That's for sure counting the days that I can see my family again. So, yeah. 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 So before we go, maybe what are a few top tips or key pieces of advice that you can give us for women or not small men? First and foremost is know your cycle. And if you don't have a normal cycle and you're on an OC, still tracking to see how you feel on certain days, because even if you are on an OC, you'll still have fluctuations. That's the first thing, like understand how your body responds. And then second is taking time to get that parasympathetic response where you know, like swimming some meditation, finding something that works for you to bring that whole stress level down because of the COVID times and the anxiety and stuff, because women can get into a ramped state of that sympathetic drive. And it's really hard to come out of. Mm -hmm. And then that is something that can really affect not only training, sleep, your mental acuity, just everything. And it affects us differently than it does men. So when we talk about anxiety and men will have a flight or fight response, well, for women, we just keep in that upcurrent of that sympathetic drive. And it's to really affect every aspect of our, of our lives. So those you are the two big the things. Health. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And Going back quickly to the youth, is there a one type of birth control that we should make sure that we are keeping our child away from when they're ready to go down that path? You know, the, the falsified moans and all this, is there something that we can look out for? Yeah. So I always ask why, you know, if they're young, I can understand when they're 16, 17, 18, they want to put yes. the contraception aspect. Contraception. But Mm -hmm. When we're looking at it, when you have a lot of people who are like, oh, my kid has really heavy bleeding, irregular periods, bad skin, there are different options that you don't have to do the OC aspect for. If periods are irregular, that's relatively normal. If your child or your daughter started her period after the age of 13, that stays really irregular for about four or five years. Mm -hmm. If start before the age of 13, then it becomes more regular at a faster rate. Not exactly sure why, but that's what happens. When we talk about bad skin, go to a dermatologist because they have great topicals and other things that you can use to actually help with that instead of looking from a hormone standpoint. And then when we think about a lack of menstrual cycle or heavy bleeding, there are two different things to address. Like heavy bleeding can be controlled through dietary changes or an IUD. And a lack of a period or being amenorrhea, could that, again, is another clinical aspect where we look at the energy availability aspect because teenagers are growing so rapidly, they might not be fueling appropriately for everything, timing of food, or it could be a lack of signaling for your luteinizing hormone. So there are other pathways to go down before the automatic response of boom, go on a pill. We're looking for contraception. Ideally, an IUD, even though that's really hard for teenagers to wrap their head around, has the least amount of effects. And it's one of the most effective means of contraception. Otherwise, we're looking at progestin only, or the last choice would be a very low dose estradiol progestin combination pill. But ideally, not really. <laughs> You just, we, grow, yeah. we grew up in this age, or I grew up in this age where, you know, you, you begin your period and then you're, as you say, the skin, the acne, and then the doctor throws at you, just take this birth control. And that's just, you know, something that I think we need to be so aware of as parents going through this to make sure that 
we have a voice for our kids because exactly. they're so young and they're going to assume that they're being told the best knowledge. But I want to make sure that they're set up for success opposed to you right. know, the back pedal. Right. Because then you'll have women who were put on the pill when they're 15 and then they're close to 30 and they want to come off it and get pregnant or other reasons. And if they had any undercurrent of a health issue and that was a primary driver for getting on an OC, it's still there when they come off it. Mm -hmm. So the OC just downregulates your natural hormones and it doesn't fix a problem if there was a problem to exist. And we so have enough hormonal things to deal with as, as we age. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much, Stacey, for coming on and spending the time with me. I truly appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, so women are not small men. Where can we find you? Social media, websites, books and courses. Yeah. I will link. Yeah. So website is drstacysims.com and then social media is pretty similar, Dr. Stacey Sims. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I had such a great time talking with Stacy. I took her course, Women Are Not Small Men, back last year, and she is now also offering Menopause for Athletes. Her next course is, I believe, launching in June. It was such an inspiring, eye-opening program, the Women Are Not Small Men one that I took. I can only imagine the same for Menopause for Athletes. And I can't wait for all of her mini courses that are also coming out in the fall, including the Teen Tween Youth Athlete Program. What an eye-opening wealth of information that she is. And if you want to level up and understand female physiology to the next level, all of her courses are worth the time and investment, truly coming from a place of a person that has done one before. So thank you again so much for tuning in. And I hope you guys enjoyed our conversation and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it. See you next week. You can find me on Instagram at MomSweatSam.com.